Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 16, Ray Bradbury. Although he's a featured author, I'll only be spending one episode on Bradbury, like most of the authors I cover. I'm sure I could spend two, he certainly had enough output for it, but if I did, the second episode would be about his fantasy stories, and that's somebody else's podcast. Ray Bradbury is the third of what I call the Big Four authors of the Golden Age of Science Fiction. He's the odd one out to people who talk about the Big Three, Asimov, Heinlein, and Clark, but other people consider him to be central to this period. Obviously, I am including him, but he is the odd one out in one respect, which is that he didn't consider himself a science fiction writer. This may be even odder when you compare him with his contemporaries. For example, Isaac Asimov always self-identified as a science fiction writer, even when he spent many years writing mostly nonfiction or other genres. But Bradbury had a different point of view. He considered himself a fantasy writer. Which is partially true. In all his long career, the longest of the big four spanning over 70 years, Ray Bradbury wrote only one true science fiction novel, not an anthology or fix-up. Fahrenheit 451. Even some of the anthologies that now make the science fiction lists, like The Martian Chronicles, didn't count for him. As he put it in a 1999 interview, quote, I don't write science fiction. I've only done one science fiction book, and that's Fahrenheit 451, based on reality. Science fiction is a depiction of the real. Fantasy is a depiction of the unreal. So Martian Chronicles is not science fiction. It's fantasy. It couldn't happen, you see. That's the reason it's going to be around a long time, because it's a Greek myth, and myths have staying power. That's not exactly the definition most people have for science fiction, but it's otherwise true that was his only science fiction novel. Of course, he didn't just write science fiction and fantasy. He also wrote horror, mystery, and several autobiographical novels, but most of all, he wrote short stories. I said before that Asimov was the only one of the big four who was known more for his short stories than his novels. However, in Bradbury's case, that's because of one single book, which is, of course, Fahrenheit 451. Set that book aside, and he's definitely known for his short stories. And when it comes to those, he may be the most prolific author in the history of the genre, with as many as 600 to his name, many of which are science fiction, or at least science fantasy. Bradbury's background was also different from his contemporaries. He didn't have the academic credentials. In fact, he only had a high school education. And he never served in the military due to bad eyesight. But instead, he took a different career path. Ray Bradbury was born in 1920 in Waukegan, Illinois, a town that greatly influenced several of his books, like Dandelion Wine and Something Wicked This Way Comes. Like many sci-fi fans of the time, he grew up reading H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, and the newer pulp stories. He started writing when he was 12, including horror stories in the style of Edgar Allan Poe, and his own sequel to Edgar Rice Burroughs' The Warlord of Mars. His family moved to Los Angeles when he was 14, which is where he really got started. In Los Angeles, he lived within roller skating distance of Hollywood, a fact that he used to get autographs and photos with the movie stars of the 30s. He met radio star George Burns there, and convinced him to bring him into the studio as a live audience, and Bradbury's first professional pay as a writer was for a sketch he wrote for the Burns and Allen show. He also became lifelong friends with special effects pioneer Ray Harryhausen, whom he met at a local science fiction club. His connections with Hollywood continued throughout his life, which is probably one thing that led his career in such a different direction. More on that later. However, again unlike his contemporaries, he didn't sell straight to the big titles, but instead started publishing in fanzines. Free, small press magazines written by rank-and-file fans, so to speak, and often incorporating fan fiction. The most famous examples are probably the Star Trek fanzines that were popular starting in the 70s. They would be more like a web serial or a fiction blog today than a professional outlet. Bradbury's first story, Holland Botcher's Dilemma, appeared in the fanzine Imagination in 1938. He then published his own fanzine, Future Fantasia, for four issues in 1939 and 40. 
He finally got into the professional market, including John W. Campbell's Astounding Stories, a couple years later, and he kept at it from there. Now, out of his hundreds of short stories, the most famous ones, the most famous of what are now considered his science fiction stories, are the ones that were later collected in his anthologies, The Martian Chronicles and The Illustrated Man. By 1949, two years after Robert Heinlein and his colleagues broke the genre wide open, publishers were in the market for science fiction novels. Bradbury, as an exclusive short fiction writer, didn't have a novel to sell. But one night, he had dinner with the editor of Doubleday, Walter Bradbury, no relation, who suggested that he combine his many stories that were set on Mars into a fix-up novel. Thus, The Martian Chronicles was born, a mashup of 28 stories about the human exploration of Mars, beginning in the then-distant year of 1999. The first expeditions to Mars end in disaster due to attacks by the native Martians, who have powerful psychic abilities. There are those fantasy elements he talked about. But the Martians are wiped out by germs introduced from Earth, leaving the planet free for humans to colonize, only to abandon it a generation later when nuclear war breaks out on Earth. The book carries definite themes of darkness and futility, especially compared with the imagery of humankind triumphant that you see in Asimov's and Heinlein's galactic empires, and that's something that comes up a lot in Bradbury's works. Partly it can be attributed to his being a horror writer in addition to the other stuff, but there was more to it than that. He seems to have done it to contrast with his very real optimism for the future. The themes aren't solely dark, but are about overcoming that darkness, and you can see it when, in both The Martian Chronicles and Fahrenheit 451, both of which end in nuclear war, he leaves room for hope afterwards. The Illustrated Man, published a year later, is more of a simple anthology than a fix-up. The frame story is that of the titular illustrated man, a traditional carnival act of a heavily tattooed man describing the meaning of his tattoos. The tattoos were supposedly designed by a time traveler and are able to move, and each one corresponds with one of the stories in the book. The stories, however, have little relation to each other. Some of them are set on Mars again, but have different world-building, different kinds of Martians, for example, such that they wouldn't have fit into the Martian Chronicles. Others are more technologically focused, like The Velt, a Black Mirror-esque tale about children being raised in a virtual reality environment. The Velt is the Dutch name for the savannah region in what is now South Africa, on which the virtual reality is based. It was shortly after he made his name with these anthologies that Bradbury published Fahrenheit 451. Predictably, it started as a novella. It was first published in Galaxy Science Fiction in 1951 as The Fireman. It was at the urging of a publisher at Ballantine Books that he expanded it into a novel that was twice the length of the original. Fahrenheit 451 is the last of the four classic dystopias that I talked about back in episode 9. It's set in the year 1999, again, in a world where books are forbidden. The title is famously the temperature at which book paper catches fire, which is about right according to experiments. In the story, Guy Montag is a fireman at the actual fire department whose job is to burn any books that are found. Fireproof materials mean that firemen aren't needed for their original job anymore. But everything changes when he is tempted to actually read a book. I think the most surprising thing about Fahrenheit 451 is that it comes across as even more relevant today, even though it may not seem like it at first glance. First of all, although it's set in a world of heavy government censorship, it's not actually about government censorship. It's not even literally about book burning. It's about culture. Bradbury takes all the negative trends he saw in the culture of the 1950s and rolls them together. The censorship the book is so famous for? As the fireman's Captain Beatty puts it, quote, Don't step on the toes of the dog lovers, the cat lovers, doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second-generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, this play, this TV serial are not meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics, anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. Unquote. So, it's about political correctness, then? Not really. 
it's something broader than that. When we complain about Hollywood making shallow, vanilla movies, lowest common denominator TV shows, or just generally playing it safe with derivative material, I think that's the culture Bradbury was calling out. Combine that with the culture of silence around McCarthyism at the time, and the condensing of information into summaries and sound bites, think everything people say is wrong with Twitter as a medium, and you can see the parallels more clearly. And while the government censorship is the most famous part of the book, the rest of the story bears this out. Without books or intellectual pursuits, society turns deeply narcissistic and nihilistic. People watch interactive but mindless TV shows that are basically soap operas with pre-written scripts, painted on all four walls of their living rooms. Teenagers run people down with their cars for fun, and everyone accepts it as just a fact of life. And the government only stepped in to burn books after almost everyone had stopped reading to begin with, and the firemen were out of work and needed something to do. I've linked a review in the description that goes into more detail about this thesis. The main thing is, there's a lot more depth to the story than the Reader's Digest version, which isn't surprising for a book that all but calls out Reader's Digest by name. And that depth may not be where you think. As an aside, it may be the ultimate irony that Fahrenheit 451 has itself been censored a fair number of times, mostly for offensive language, including a bolderized edition by the publisher themselves aimed at high school students. Bradbury demanded they retract that edition when he found out. Some of Bradbury's other novels also became famous, but they weren't science fiction. For example, he wrote Dandelion Wine, a fix-up of deeply autobiographical stories about childhood, which he followed up with Farewell Summer, a sequel published nearly 50 years later in 2006. Both of these and a third book, Something Wicked This Way Comes, were set in the town of Greentown, Illinois, which was based on his native Waukegan. Something Wicked This Way Comes, though, was a children's fantasy horror story, centering around a haunted traveling carnival, possibly the same one from The Illustrated Man. This same fantasy horror style reappears in his other famous children's book, The Halloween Tree. Meanwhile, he also wrote still more autobiographical stories and several mystery novels. But again, this podcast is about sci-fi. Bradbury's catalog of short stories is far too long to examine in depth, but I would like to mention three famous ones that appeared after The Martian Chronicles and The Illustrated Man. The most famous of the three, on the short list of all his stories, has to be A Sound of Thunder. This is a time travel story about a company that runs safaris in prehistoric times where people can hunt tyrannosaurs and other dinosaurs, carefully mapping things out to avoid changing history but one of the hunters panics and runs off the path, stepping on a butterfly. The butterfly wasn't accounted for, and when they return to the present, they find that crushing it has changed history in subtle ways. English is now spelled phonetically, and the presidential candidate who had lost before their trip, whom the characters consider a fascist, has now won. Insert your own 2020 joke here. Interestingly, this story was not the origin of the term butterfly effect. While it was written before that term was first used, the butterfly effect was coined by meteorologist Edward Norton Lorenz, who is also known for the Lorenz attractor for the math buffs out there, who used it to describe the effect of a butterfly flapping its wings, not being stepped on. Bradbury's use of a butterfly was purely coincidental. Also, if your actions in the past could affect history at all, just being there would change things enough to erase the entire human species from existence but that doesn't make as good a story. Another of his famous stories is All Summer in a Day, about a human colony on Venus. Based on the science of the 1950s, Venus was believed at the time to be a wet tropical planet, and since it was known to be covered with clouds, Bradbury envisioned it as a world of constant rainstorms, where the sun is visible for only an hour every seven years. It's short but deeply emotional and worth a read. And the third story I wanted to mention is called The Foghorn. You might not have heard of that one. I hadn't. But you probably have heard of its original title, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. The rights to the story were purchased shortly after its publication to lend Bradbury's name and fame to the first giant monster movie of the Atomic Age. Bradbury wasn't directly involved with that movie. But in fact, he wrote other screenplays, 
The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms earned him enough credibility that he was hired to co-write the screenplay for the 1956 version of Moby Dick. Before this, he had also written the original screen treatment for It Came From Outer Space. I'm not sure what the difference is beyond formatting, but that's not the same as a screenplay. However, he did write other screenplays, including for some of the film adaptations of his own books, like Something Wicked This Way Comes and The Halloween Tree, which he also narrated. And he wrote several Alfred Hitchcock skits and Twilight Zone episodes. Maybe as a Los Angeles native and a friend of Harryhausen's, he had an easier time breaking into Hollywood. But he didn't stop at TV and movies either. Bradbury also wrote stage plays, including stage adaptations of Fahrenheit 451, The Martian Chronicles, and Dandelion Wine. And of course, he wrote a few nonfiction books too, notably including Zen in the Art of Writing. The other interesting thing about Bradbury was how he remained active all the way to the end of his life, not just in writing, but in public appearances and events. Despite his lack of academic credentials, he was absolutely involved with the scientific community. In 1980, Bradbury was one of the people who urged Carl Sagan and Bruce C. Murray to create the Planetary Society to advocate for the exploration of our solar system. And even in the week of his death, the 91-year-old Bradbury had been scheduled to record a clip commemorating the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars. That clip was never filmed, but his legacy continued. And this is one place where I have a personal story to contribute to this podcast. When Curiosity landed a couple months later, in August of 2012, I attended the Planetary Society's Planet Fest event in Pasadena to watch it. There, Lewis Friedman, one of the other founders of the Society, gave a tribute to Bradbury. Link to the video in the description. That tribute has stuck with me these past eight years, and it's helped me to understand Ray Bradbury and his writings better. He wrote about gloom and darkness in much of his writing, but he did it to write about overcoming that darkness. He wrote the dystopian horror of Fahrenheit 451 as a warning to society to avoid that fate. And even then, he left hope for the future and rebuilding a better society. Amidst the dark subject matter of his books, he truly believed in the joy of exploration, overcoming the naysayers, and optimism for the future. Possibly the best rendition of this sentiment came from Bradbury himself in 1971 in a poem, yes, he wrote poetry too, commemorating Mariner 9 becoming the first spacecraft to orbit Mars, as published in Mars and the Mind of Man. In part, it reads, quote, What shall we whistle as we stroll in our rocket, hoping to make it by the vast darkness where shadows wait to seize and keep us? Follow me. I know a tune. Here. Listen. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available a bunch of places. I don't remember them all. I just slapped it on all the major ones. And you can find my other writing on my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. My book recommendation for this episode is Fahrenheit 451. Yes, I'm kind of biased because novels hold my interest better than short stories do, but it's a good book. And like all good dystopias, it still remains frighteningly relevant today. Next episode, we round out the big four Golden Age authors with Arthur C. Clarke. Thanks for listening.